Hello everybody, welcome to New Frontiers in Lyme Disease Testing, hosted by Regenerous Laboratories. And I'm really delighted to welcome today Dr. Karsten Nikolaus uh, from BCA Labs and uh, Clinic in Germany. Dr. Nikolaus is one of the world's leading experts in Lyme disease. And um, one of the things I think that makes Dr. Nikolaus stand out among the crowd is that he is also a clinician. So he is um, an MD and working in a um, very big, very busy clinic running, I should really say, a very big, very busy clinic specialising in treatment for people with Lyme and um, related infectious illness. Uh, so he's coming to us today speaking from many, many years of clinical experience as well as, um, of course, with the background of the testing and um, you know, a, a very solid understanding also of the medical literature and the, and the research science um, surrounding Lyme and related infectious illness. So welcome, Dr. Nicolas. We're really happy to have you with us today. Thank you very much, uh, Robin, for the warm welcome. And I also um, appreciate uh, to get um, uh, invite, uh, the invitation for today's um, uh, uh, topics about Lyme disease testing and if there are some other uh, questions around the uh, field of tick-borne diseases, I will be happy uh, to answer all these questions and a really um, uh, a very warm welcome to all the listeners. I'm, um, I'm very pleased um, uh, uh, to be part of this um, uh, broadcast today. Thank you. So we're going to be talking about Lyme and testing in a lot of technical detail and all of the nitty gritty. But before we jump into that, actually, I would like to start with two personal questions, if I may. So those two questions are, number one, what made you decide to be a doctor? How did you get into medicine in the first place? Yeah. And number two is the follow up question to that, which is how did you come to specialize in Lyme disease specifically? Okay, uh, both questions are easy to answer. Uh, so I can't tell you. So uh, in our family's tradition, there was never a doctor before. And um, so um, it was quite clear for me being age 12 to become a doctor. Yeah. So um, and um, uh, from that point on, I tried everything um, uh, to finish as best as possible uh, my school. And um, so after joining the military services here in Germany, I got really the opportunity uh, to start with my medical training. And um, so that's the reason why I'm sitting here uh, today in um, this uh, conference. And, um, you know, um, uh, so uh, becoming a Lyme expert, this was more uh, coincidentally. So um, uh, my uh, background was a bit different in former times. So I started uh, my medical training uh, or during my medical training, um, working uh, in one of the um, uh, transplant centers here in Germany, in Munich at the Klinikum Rechts der ISA and in parallel uh, I did a lot of uh, immunological research and that's the reason that I've also my PhD done in immunology um, um, uh, in the 80s and uh, so with this background um, I worked for several we uh, years first in Munich um, uh, uh, um, at this uh, transplant unit and later on I moved to Augsburg which is um, on, uh, one hour west of, um, uh, of Munich um, um, uh, to do some follow-ups regarding uh, transplantation medicine. And um, a bit later, uh, due to uh, um, other reasons, um, I decided uh, to, op uh, to open a practice uh, here in Augsburg. And um, so really in my first week, uh, being a GP later on, um, um, uh, my first Lyme patient stepped in. Uh, and this was pretty easy because uh, this patient was telling me that he was infected for at least five years and um, uh, uh, he wanted to get some uh, new recommendation um, uh, uh, to get more improvement. So, um, so you know, um, I definitely had no expertise at that point um, uh, regarding uh, Lyme disease or any other tick-borne diseases. So my only knowledge was to re uh, in any case to remove, uh, remove as soon as, as possible uh, the tick after a bite and uh, then to go. Um, um, so in case of confirmation by doing lab test or um, in presence of an erythema migrans to start immediately for two weeks with 
uh, antibiotics at that time, first line recommendation was doxycycline, and that was, uh, was exactly what I have done. Um, a bit later, and this patient um, uh, had that experience in the past, so I was the 13th doctor in a row um, um, uh, 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 who was asked uh, for um, for better treatment uh, regarding still remaining symptoms. And uh, when I um, um, uh, uh, gave my proposals uh, to go back for two weeks on antibiotics, um, the patient was first very disappointed uh, because uh, his expectation was completely different. And um, so, um, so I had a challenge to find a better way. And um, so I did so. Um, uh, so I kept in contact with uh, several researchers at that time. And uh, uh, one of them was an American colleague um, uh, who told me that uh, there had been some um, uh, proposals uh, to put uh, patients a bit longer on treatment. So this guy was good connected to Professor Burgdorfer, who had um, found a Borrelia uh, in the gut of ticks um, uh, beginning of the 80s. And um, he's an, uh, he was an entomologist uh, and not an MD. And, but his proposal was um, uh, to start treatment for a minimum of two to three life cycles or re uh, replication cycles. And that was, um, uh, and it was suggested um, that was um, between eight and 12 weeks. And this is exactly what I did with my first Lyme patient. And uh, fortunately, after four weeks, uh, the patient started to improve. Um, this was a good experience, but uh, later, uh, same year, uh, I noted that my practice was located, uh, today we would say, in one of the highest endemic areas for tick-borne diseases in Germany. And um, so, uh, with other words, so in the following years, uh, more and more patients uh, stepped into my practice um, um, every week. And uh, so, over the time, I got more and more expertise, um, more knowledge. And at the beginning, it was um, uh, only try and error, I can, t I can tell you. But uh, from uh, mid of the 90s, um, uh, there was more and more research. And um, uh, I joined my first conference in 1995 in Munich, uh, organized by one of the big uh, universities. And this was in some kind also another breakthrough um, to get better connection to researchers, physicians worldwide. And from this point on, uh, everything was a bit more easier for me. So already you said something that has really stood out to me as being different from the experience of the patient here in the UK in the medical system, which is you listened to what your patient was saying to you and you tried to provide um, support and you, you had to think outside the box of what you knew already at that moment in order to find answers for him. I don't, I don't think that that is a an experience that a lot of people here in the UK ex uh, have in the in when they go to see their GP for example so that already I think makes you stand out to me just that you said that and that was your first Lyme patient that was no no exactly and uh, you know uh, being a research and scientist before um, I was trained um, uh, uh, to try my very best to sing out of the box yeah <laughs> Uh, uh, sometimes uh, you have to enter uh, in new, um, uh, new fields and this is what exactly what happened uh, beginning of the 90s and uh, you know and a bit later and this is uh, if you're uh, going through life with open eyes you will um, uh, uh, recognize um, uh, and especially if you see a lot of Lyme patient and at that time we had been really focused only on Lyme so uh, I had no clue about uh, all the other um, or the, about the complexity um, uh, all the influence by other what we now call co-infection. So I was really just focused on Lyme. But um, I, I started very soon uh, seeing more and more patients uh, uh, to, uh, to recognize specific patterns, uh, uh, which means, so, you know, if you go into the guidelines or into the medical books, uh, you will find um, uh, some phrases, so uh, Lyme is easy to diagnose, easy to treat. So uh, they are uh, safe signs like an erythema migrans and uh, if um, uh, an EM occurs, you can immediately start with two weeks of doxycycline or something else, and that's it. Um, you have, um, uh, based on the books, uh, always 100% um, uh, chance of uh, full improvement. And, uh, but um, so um, uh, over a certain time, I noted that is uh, completely nonsense. And 
Um, so again, I observed specific patterns. So uh, many of my patients presented always um, uh, what we now call unspecific symptoms, uh, like tiredness, like uh, um, uh, 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 misfeelings um, on the surface of their skin, uh, very severe on different forms of headache, um, muscle pain, joint pain, tendon problems, um, uh, uh, GI problems, uh, means uh, belly pain, uh, abdominal cramps, uh, sometimes a change of diarrhea and constipation, um, uh, vision problems. So uh, any organ system uh, um, uh, could have been affected and that is what I have noticed very early and I started uh, to make my notes uh, about these symptoms and complaints and much later um, I put that um, into a summary and um, uh, and for me it was quite clear as someone um, uh, presenting uh, these typical call it unspecific, but these typical symptoms and complaints, um, this is something which is very supportive uh, to find later on the diagnosis. And um, uh, so based on these uh, experiences um, uh, in the 19th, uh, we later on uh, went on um, some supportive tools for doctors. Um, so together uh, with my uh, former partner, uh, we developed um, a, a prediction tool for co-infections and meanwhile, uh, we are working on an extended version, um, even to give, uh, to, uh, to give um, uh, uh, doctors who are not so well experienced with all these symptoms, um, complaints, uh, which we see in most of these uh, chronic infections, uh, to find um, uh, much better out um, what the reason could be. So one of, the, uh, one of the things that I think is important to understand for people who are new to Lyme, um, is that it's not just a matter of you suspect there might be Lyme because the person has reported a tick bite. Yeah. Um, so you do a test, the test comes back positive or negative, and then you know that they have it or they don't have it. That actually the person presenting with you may have a very broad range of non-specific symptoms. Exactly. And so one of the things that you have done to help clinicians who don't have as broad an experience is you've written all of those symptoms down. So you've collected the symptoms of Borrelia um, and also for the co-infections. So taking a very thorough history from the person and then recognizing the constellation and the collection of symptoms or referring back to the sheet so that you can have a look and see, okay, they've got this set of symptoms that's very um, uh, indicative of or you know, suspicious of let's say Borrelia and Babesia or Borrelia and Ehrlichia, um, you would then run the testing panel as a way to try to confirm your suspicions. And it's the, it's the combination of those three things, the comprehensive history and listening to the patient telling their story, um, identifying the symptoms from the clusters of, of, from the diverse set of symptoms that somebody might be experiencing, and then overlaying that with appropriate um, laboratory testing. No, that is exactly um, um, uh, uh, correct what you have said. Uh, you know, um, uh, so in most of the uh, uh, medical books, you can uh, read that, um, uh, especially Lyme disease, but you will find these um, uh, uh, recommendations also uh, for other uh, bacterial co-infections. Uh, it's uh, mostly based on a clinical diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then if you're lucky, you can confirm uh, your suspicion um, or your suspicion the suspected um, uh, infection later on by doing lab tests and, that, uh, and not vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, um, so uh, it's, um, uh, it's very helpful um, uh, if you have seen a lot of patients uh, from um, this uh, medical field of tick-borne diseases. So automatically over the time, uh, you will get uh, a lot of um, expertise regarding uh, the very common symptoms and complaints. And this is uh, uh, so far uh, supportive uh, because you have some, um, for, uh, uh, some overlapping symptoms, which could be seen in many of these uh, different um, infectious diseases, for example, uh, artralgia or myalgia. Uh, this is a very common finding and could be based uh, ev uh, even on other uh, uh, medical diagnoses or uh, health condition. Uh, 
Um, but um, uh, patients are also presenting very specific symptoms and complaints, which are, for example, unique for Bartonella or unique for Babesia. And if you are listen carefully to the patient in the first contact, you will get a lot of information. And then the red flags are getting up. Um, uh, so uh, showing you the right direction finally to, um, uh, uh, to get um, uh, the right testing and uh, hopefully the confirmation or uh, if you are lucky, the exclusion of uh, your suspicion. So just for everybody on the webinar, Regeneris has available to anybody who wants it, the symptom checklist for, um, for co-infections. And um, Dr. Nicolaus is also in the process of creating a new tool uh, which is called the Multi-Infectious Diseases Prediction Tool, which is an updated version. Um, it's undergoing validation at the moment, but should be available from uh, about two weeks. Yeah, well, hopefully at the end of the month, so latest beginning of June, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, uh, so the so-called co-infection list um, was um, uh, um, uh, focused only on the typical co-infection. But meanwhile, um, we have noticed more and more onset of specific strains of Borrelia, not only the common ones here in Europe, like Borrelia burgdorferi, uh, Senso stricto group, and Sensulato, or um, the, um, the Garini uh, uh, strain, or the um, uh, Afzeli strain. There are many different other specific strains, uh, meanwhile, um, uh, seen, spread it all over the world or spe specifically here in Europe. And um, we have also in the new uh, approach integrated um, uh, the uh, specific symptoms, for example, of uh, Borrelia myomotui um, or, or others or the relapsing uh, Borrelia fever group. And uh, so it's um, uh, in the future much easier um, uh, to get uh, some, some knowledge um, on what you can test later on, not um, uh, for wasting any money. Brilliant. So, so for the clinicians, just to be clear, so we're going to start in your clinical practice, you're going to start with taking a very comprehensive history and listening to your patient tell the story. Second step is to really familiarize yourself with the list of symptoms. So Regeneris has the uh, existing tool available and we will be providing the updated tool with all of the different strains um, of the Borrelia and the symptoms associated with those, which is brand new and um, the most up-to-date uh, as soon as it's available. So then third, of course, we're going to be talking about testing. So mm -hmm. I think this is probably quite a good um, point in the webinar for us to go over the uh, existing panel. So the existing line panel. We're just, I'm just, we're just going to be showing for the um, for the purpose of this particular webinar, we're just going to be showing the example document of uh, the uh, specific to Lyme. Um, for everybody watching at home, it is in the chat box. There is actually a link to uh, a sample report. I'm about to bring it up on the screen now, and Dr. Nicolas is going to run through it. So, um, uh, let me hang on. Let me just share the screen. Okay, can you see that? Is that um... no? No, I got it. Hopefully, um, everybody could see uh, one of these final reports. Okay, well, so... this is one of the um, this is one of the basic. Um, uh, testings. Um, so if uh, there's any suspicion um, um, uh, of Lyme disease, so, you know, um, uh, based on the uh, reg uh, uh, regulations, so in most of the European countries, um, you have to go at first for the so-called uh, two-tier testing. Um, uh, so we, uh, we are doing the same uh, just to legal reasons. Uh, we are pretty aware. So the first test you can see is a typical serological uh, testing uh, system called ELISA test. Um, this is the first one. So in this case, um, um, uh, uh, we have tested on two different immunoglobulins antibodies, so IgG and IgM. Uh, IgM uh, means um, uh, acute stage um, of Lyme disease. So if you see a pathological finding exactly um, how um, it is on this lab report, um, and this is uh, the first indication um, that the patient could have um, uh, recently uh, a tick bite. So IgM is um, uh, 
normally existing for at least three months, sometimes a bit longer, and would indicate an acute infection, means stage one or stage two um, of uh, Borrelia. Um, so a bit later, so starting um, uh, uh, at the end of the third month, so latest after six months, uh, there should be automatically a switch on uh, so-called IgG antibodies. So uh, in this case, uh, it was negative uh, below the normal range. Mm -hmm. um, but um, uh, if there had been an older contact or uh, if we would uh, do a follow-up of this patient around three or six months later, uh, we would expect, um, uh, again, only IgG antibodies. Um, so in this specific case, um, uh, without having any uh, information about uh, the medical anamnesis or history of these patients, it looked like um, at first as an um, uh, acute stage of Lyme disease, so um, a stage one or stage two. Um, no, uh, uh, so in the ELIDA test, no signs of um, uh, chronicity so far. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one um, uh, group of patients, and um, uh, I want to mention that uh, at this point, um, there's, a, there's a group of about 10% um, uh, of all patients we see in our daily consultation. They will present uh, for a long time, for years or decades, only IgM antibodies. So um, uh, it could be that this patient um, uh, has uh, even the chronic stage of Lyme, and uh, this is what we call the IgM persister. Um, this is a specific um, a constellation, uh, which again, which we see in around 10% of the patients. So if you get um, uh, from the medical history uh, information that there had been a contact elder than uh, three months uh, of a tick bite, elder than three months, um, uh, years or decades before, um, and uh, if we see later in the other testings um, in, a, uh, uh, in a few seconds, um, indication of very severe immunosuppression in the CD57 cells, mm -hmm. it could be also an indicator of chronic Lyme. And how accurate, I mean, no, not accurate, what, how helpful do you think um, antibody testing is in uh, understanding if somebody has Lyme or not? The rules are, um, uh, so automatically we have to start with an ELISA test mm -hmm. and only if you would find um, pathological um, uh, uh, results, mm -hmm. uh, you have to confirm this results by running a second test. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the one below, the Borrelia burgdorferi blot. This okay. is a so-called Western blot test. Mm -hmm. um, uh, regarding the accuracy, uh, it's quite easy to answer your question. So the ELISA test unfortunately has a good specificity, uh, means uh, that's around 99%, mm -hmm. uh, but the sensitivity is pretty bad. So there had been seven uh, studies in the past of, um, uh, 10 years showing that the ELISA test um, uh, is um, a maximum somewhere between uh, 35 and 70 percent. On average, um, uh, means the sensitivity is around 50 percent. Uh, that means um, uh, 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 on a regular basis, uh, every second patient uh, will fail. So they, uh, um, the patient will have Lyme, um, but uh, there is no further testing because of seronegativity, and that's a, ch a challenge. So, um, and uh, originally, uh, the ELISA test and the Wester blot uh, was not uh, developed for, um, for, uh, for testing. It was developed for epidemiological uh, studies. Okay. Uh, so, um, um, so this is the reason why uh, this uh, kind of testing is pretty bad. Um, so the second test, the Borrelia uh, uh, burgdorferi western blot, mm -hmm. um, is um, uh, much more accurate. So on average, um, somewhere between, um, it, uh, uh, there are diff uh, um, uh, difference between uh, the different uh, uh, test kit producer. Um, so somewhere between uh, 80 and 95 percent, which is much much better. So mm -hmm. the sensitivity is much higher. So um, if we would go only uh, for a Western blot, the chance um, of a uh, detection um, uh, is better and um, uh, more reliable for the patient. So, um, but uh, due to, again, due to legal reason, we always uh, go on both. Uh, but automatically, always 
on ELISA and Western blot, and not only uh, in uh, case of positive, uh, positive results. Okay, so, uh, so, so in, can, can I just ask you a question? Could you explain for people who aren't that familiar with this testing, what is Western blot and how does it differ to that? Yeah, ELISA Western blot um, is also part of the serological testing. That means uh, we are looking for the humoral side of the immune response. Mm -hmm. so production of antibodies. Okay. Antibodies are specific um, uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, expression on the surface of um, bacteria or viruses to mm -hmm. identify um, uh, the bacteria. Mm -hmm. yeah. That means, um, so you can see here um, uh, uh, a long list of what we call bands or mm -hmm. antigens. So P, it starts with um, P18, P19. It's, um, uh, uh, it's a long line of uh, different um, uh, structures uh, which will be checked. And these structures are uh, on the surface of uh, each bacterium, could be in this case Borrelia, but the same technique could be used for other bacterial or viral infections. So by, by structures, do you mean amino acid sequences, proteins? Um, uh, so, you know, these, um, uh, the, uh, um, the um, the listed bands uh, will, uh, if you are, if you have the um, the, uh, the right expertise, uh, mm -hmm. you can see so-called early bands mm -hmm. um, or late bands. Um, mm -hmm. This gives you some more information um, um, about the time range um, a patient are suffering from Lyme. Mm -hmm. So if you have a typically um, an early band, yeah, this mm -hmm. indicates, and if that fits to the ELISA IgM testing, uh, then you have a more clearer picture about the timeline. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are also some uh, so-called uh, late-stage bands. Um, so if they are positive, um, you have definitely an indicator that we are dealing uh, with, uh, for example, late-stage uh, infections. And, and uh, there's some uh, specific um, uh, also in the Western blot. Mm -hmm. You see at the, um, uh, at the bottom um, the uh, so-called VLSE. BB, BB, and BA. Mm -hmm. so the VS, uh, VLSE antigen is um, uh, is not a variable. Uh, that means uh, if um, if this band will show up positive, or uh, in this case it was very weak, borderline, mm -hmm. so a weak positive, um, then you will um, have um, uh, um, uh, specific information. So in this case, BB um, was borderline, that means Borrelia burgdorferi. So this strain of Borrelia, which is most often responsible for all the musculoskeletal problems. Mm -hmm. and, um, there are some um, uh, publication uh, mentioning, so if, um, if, you, if VLSE antigen is uh, found in the testing, mm -hmm. um, this is uh, meanwhile uh, an indication uh, to start treatment. So there's a need to treat patient, but this is only um, uh, um, uh, uh, guilty for the VLSE antigen. So just, um, just using this example report, so P41, band P41 has come up positive for IgG yeah. and borderline for IgM, mm -hmm. and you've got the VLSE uh, BB as borderline. So would you consider this to be a positive result? Um, so uh, uh, not a real positive, that's the reason. So based on, the, uh, on, uh, on uh, any guidelines, you need minimum two safe bands. Uh, that means to, uh, to get a positive positive result or mean a pathological finding. In this case, P41 uh, is a so-called unspecific um, uh, band, means uh, P41 is also seen on other bacteria, for example, like chlamydia. It's not specific enough, um, uh, but uh, VLSE Borrelia burgdorferi, borderline, means uh, there is in some kind suspicion that the patient uh, showing up with a positive IgM <laughs> A positive uh, IgM antibody in the ELISA test, um, there's some more suspicion um, uh, that uh, we are um, really on the right way to get the uh, clinical diagnosis or the, the diagnosis of Lyme disease. And um, the same is we are always checking uh, the IgG antigens and the IG, um, uh, IgM, even mm -hmm. to figure out uh, acute or uh, late stage infections. So is P41, is that a flagella protein? Exactly, yeah. Okay, so um, the flagella is the kind of tail that the um, microbe uses to propel itself around. So it's not specific just to, um, uh, to Borrelia in this instance. They, a flagella protein can be found on another microbe that also has a flagella, is that right? 
Um, so, um, so far, uh, going back on the testing, uh, there's definitely a very high suspicion um, that um, uh, uh, this patient could have some problems with Lyme disease. And um, even more suspicion if you go further in the lab testing. So the next part uh, is um, uh, the so-called cellular testing. Mm -hmm. uh, we have two options to get additional information. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the options is uh, to run uh, um, the so-called ELI spot. Mm -hmm. um, this is available Borrelia and many other uh, bacterial and viral and parasitic infection. Mm -hmm. So Borrelia, um, the, uh, the cellular testing um, um, uh, uh, is based on, um, uh, on specific parts of the white blood cells. So we are harvesting the uh, T lymphocytes mm -hmm. um, of a patient. Um, and the, the T lymphocytes uh, will uh, 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 be brought in contact uh, with specific antigens and then uh, we will be able to measure um, the interferon gamma production. So it's an indirect test, uh, but giving us um, a good information about um, the actual activity of, um, of um, any of these bacterial inf uh, infections. Okay, and, so it's, it's, um, so it's in measuring, case, sorry, oh. it's measuring interferon gamma production. Yeah. Uh, in response to exposure of the lymphocyte from the patient to uh, antigens, specific and the, antigens. Exactly, exactly. Okay. And um, so, um, uh, so 15 is, by the way, a very high value. Um, so uh, the uh, real pathological uh, range will start uh, with four or higher than four spots. And 15 is uh, uh, indeed a high, uh, uh, high activity, which okay. indicates uh, that there's a uh, still ongoing problem um, uh, of the host immune system um, uh, with Borrelia. Can that be a uh, hypersensitivity of the immune system uh, because the person was exposed in the past? Uh, it could be, for sure, it could be. Um, so we see also uh, pathological results uh, mm -hmm. uh, in patients uh, who have been in late stage or chronic stages of Lyme. Mm -hmm. So this is, um, uh, uh, so our understanding is, so uh, if we see higher values um, of these spot spots, um, uh, there, we have definitely to keep in mind that Borrelia is uh, in, uh, in this patient still act active in the background and making some trouble. And if you saw that at a two or a three, what would be your interpretation? Yeah, uh, it depends. So, uh, you know, a zero and one would mm -hmm. be uh, actual no activity, no interferon gamma production, mm -hmm. which indicates, um, uh, so uh, in, um, uh, in, uh, in best cases, the patient uh, is free of any uh, Borrelia. And in the borderline range between two and four, um, we have to keep in mind then the, uh, then the interpretation is based on the clinical finding and symptoms. Mm -hmm. uh, we had to learn, uh, starting with this new technique around 10 years ago, um, that uh, 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 it might be that at the beginning, uh, there's only weak activity seen. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes two, sometimes three or four, so a, um, uh, a very weak value, mm -hmm. um, but uh, this could uh, be connected to a very weak immune system or mm -hmm. to the fact, and uh, this is something we have to uh, discuss later on again, uh, we are aware that Borrelia could be present in host organism in different forms. Mm -hmm. what all the so-called polymorphic forms. Mm -hmm. uh, so not only in the original spirochetal form, um, uh, we know about other um, um, uh, 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 ones like uh, the former cystic, now round body form. So Borrelia could be uh, seen as an intracellular bacterium. And mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, uh, the round body forms and the intracellular ones um, uh, 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 doesn't um, uh, uh, have, uh, uh, don't have any influence uh, on the uh, interferon gamma production. They are inactive in some way. Okay. And so all of the proteins that are used as antigens for this panel, uh, for these for these tests, for the um, you know the the ELISA testing, etc., are they all from the spirochete form? Uh, yes, of course, and this is uh, and this is uh, really um, uh, the limit of this testing. So you know, um, so um, uh, you know, 
um, in the past, we have always seen a lot of patients who had run the two-tier testing with zero negativity. Mm -hmm. And this was a challenge. Uh, these patients uh, very often presented the typical clinical symptoms of Lyme, the safe ones as well as the unspecific ones um, uh, as we uh, uh, have discussed before. Mm -hmm. and, um, but uh, they are showing up with no pathological findings in any testings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was better uh, uh, when we introduced the cellular testing, so the second part of the immune response. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, at the beginning, the ELISPOR technique was used um, as an alternative way of detection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we see the ELISPOR more as a uh, very, very good staging parameter. Mm -hmm. um, if we see um, a pathological finding means a certain amount of activity, uh, then it suggests uh, that Borrelia is, is still uh, active. Again, it's an indirect testing, mm -hmm. um, but it will give us um, very um, uh, uh, important information. And um, so we always um, go for that testing before starting any treatment, uh, while patient will be treated and mm -hmm. afterwards. That means uh, we see in the follow-up the development. Mm -hmm. um, so most of the patient will start, as in this case, with very high activity. And if we would start now with any antimicrobial treatment, the conventional ones, alternative ones, uh, you will see in the follow-up uh, a drop down normally of the activity, it means lower and lower counts over the time. Mm -hmm. And um, at the end, um, hopefully um, uh, getting um, a good outcoming results or full improvement. There shouldn't be any more uh, activity, it means uh, the ELI spot should be zero or one, okay. nothing else. Um, <clears throat> okay. Fantastic. And uh, is the so the interferon gamma response um, that you're measuring with Ellie Spot? How who 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 developed that as a um, as as a laboratory test? Uh, is it has it been is it published? Is it used conventionally no. as well, or is it? No, there are definitely some publications. So the background for this testing um, uh, uh, was not uh, to detect on tick-borne diseases. So mm -hmm. um, I mentioned at the beginning. So my background uh, was to uh, 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 to be in the past um, a specialist for transplantation medicine. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so traditionally, these testings uh, had been developed here in Germany very early in the 90s, but not for Lyme patient. Mm -hmm. uh, it was um, uh, a test system to get um, earlier and much faster um, information about acute infection and transplant uh, uh, patients. So, mm -hmm. you know, the challenge in transplant medicine is the organ rejection mm -hmm. or acute infection, mm -hmm. viral infection, as well as bacterial infection. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty hard um, uh, uh, to go uh, to come to the right treatment decision, either uh, with more immunosuppressive agents, so mm -hmm. like cortisone at that time, or um, uh, cyclosporin A in the 90s, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, to drop down. Um, uh, uh, if, there, if, if there was a rejection, you need immu immunosuppression. Mm -hmm. If there is an onset of an acute infection, um, if you go for more immunosuppressant, um, you will lose the organ and um, very often the patient uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 will come uh, or came to death. So mm -hmm. for this reason, we need a very fast uh, identification uh, mm -hmm. what it is. And, and therefore, uh, two research groups in Germany started with first trial, one at the biggest hospital in Germany at the Charité in Berlin, mm -hmm. uh, Professor von Beer, and in Munich in parallel, Professor Bieger uh, started uh, with um, cellular testing at the beginning called lymphocyte transformation testing mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, to get these needed information for transplant uh, uh, patients. And uh, that works very well. Um, so um, uh, uh, for, uh, uh, Professor Beer uh, was in front of Professor Bieger with the first publication. So he was officially uh, the developer of the lymphocyte transformation testing. Mm -hmm. And much later, uh, uh, at the end of the 90s, uh, this test method um, uh, was also um, uh, started in, uh, uh, in using that for Lyme disease. Very successful, uh, also developed from, uh, uh, from Professor von Beer um, in Berlin. Mm -hmm. 
um, so the problem with the lymphocyte transformation uh, testing was it was not a standardized testing. So mm -hmm. we had several labs at that uh, time in Germany offering these services, mm -hmm. but unfortunately the results haven't been comparable to each other. Mm -hmm. So there was no um, general uh, recognition and acceptance to run that at the regular test. Um, this changed um, uh, uh, dramatically um, uh, around one decade later. Mm -hmm. um, so in the uh, 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 so around uh, 20, uh, 2008 um, exactly, uh, there was a uh, there was a, a, a new uh, a company in the southwest of Germany um, trying to standardize this technique, and that was um, 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 uh, the birth of um, of the Elispot test. The ELISPAT is meanwhile a complete standardized testing, so you can uh, run this test in any lab and the results are comparable to each other. So when, when you told me in our pre-webinar chat that you, your background was transplant medicine, because I didn't actually know that about you before, I thought at that time how perfect that was as a segue into Lyme disease, because of course your knowledge of infectious agents is life-saving you know in that space but i didn't know i didn't ask you that that specific question in our pre-chat i didn't know that this specific part of the test actually also had its origins in transplant medicine which seems so um uh, perfect actually yeah no, for so that's sure. fascinating um, uh, now the ely spot is mm -hmm. very similar uh, to the testings i have worked with um, uh, mid of the 80s yeah mm -hmm. and the, the technique is a bit different meanwhile um, uh, so um, uh, more uh, customized um, easier uh, to handle you know the uh, the old fashioned lymphocyte transplantation that uh, um, had a need of uh, one one week to get results which is also um, uh, a long time mm -hmm. uh, with uh, some uh, new uh, technical um, uh, progress and now um, you can run this type of testing exactly in 27 hours wow. and get standardized um, uh, results and this gives us even the chance to use the Elispot technique as a very early uh, detection uh, also for acute stages um, so what we have learned uh, around two to three days after getting a tick bite without an erythema migrant, uh, you can um, uh, start with an um, uh, early spot on uh, Borrelia. And um, uh, so if there was any transmission, you can find higher rates of activity. And uh, this is an important information for the former discussed serological tests like ELISA and Western blot. You meet um, a timeline of minimum two and a half weeks for the production of your um, immune system uh, for these needed antibodies. Mm -hmm. So it's a long time uh, in between. So um, uh, that, with other words, it would be possible now to get much earlier um, uh, information about an acute infection. That is what we are doing on a regular basis. So, you know, um, so um, this year um, seems to be uh, the worst tick year than ever. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, as soon as the snow had melted here in Bavaria, we mm -hmm. got the first acute um, uh, Lyme infection. So, mm -hmm. Um, and um, so uh, if patients are stepping in with the uh, tick, um, uh, we, um, uh, we um, uh, recommend our patient um, uh, to go on an early testing two or three days after getting the tick bite mm -hmm. to get first evidence of possible transmission. And if we see higher rates of, um, uh, of ELIS uh, in the ELI spot, so mm -hmm. um, higher activity, um, then you can start much easier uh, with um, uh, antimicrobials. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, just to prevent patients um, uh, for uh, really uh, severe symptoms later on. Okay, so you can, so the yellow spot um, is uh, reactive much more quickly than the antibody panels because antibodies have a life uh, lifespan of 25 to 50 days. So it takes a couple of weeks yeah, exactly. for them to come up enough to be measured on the test yeah. in the first place so you have a here the the turnaround time of the test is faster and the response is much more is much quicker and you know, so. this is um, um uh, a mistake we 
very often see um, uh, here um, uh, uh, in our patients. So the, the, uh, the ELISA or the two-tier testing um, has been very often too early started. So uh, uh, some days after the tick bite, and there was no chance to, uh, to produce or to present any antibodies. And if you're getting back uh, a negative test result, the doctor will tell you, no, that's nothing. Um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, there's no hint or a sign of Lyme disease. Um, and this is a problem. If you would do that exactly, so earliest after three weeks or 20 days, um, the, um, um, the, uh, the testing is much more reliable and accurate. Brilliant. <clears throat> okay, so that brings us to the end of the um, infectious part of the panel. And now um, if we have a look at the next two um, bands on the panel, we see that we're looking now at the patient's immune system or markers of the immune system. So um, the next um, in the, the, the next part of the test is the CD. CD57. The status, uh, the CD57 cell test. Mm -hmm. uh, this is for me one of the important part of uh, diagnostic because this is the only uh, parameter which uh, could give us some information about chronicity or chronic infection. Mm -hmm. uh, so there had been meanwhile three different publications. So the first, I guess in 1995 uh, from, uh, from US um, done by Stricker and Stinger. Uh, later on there was an Italian study and recently a new one. Mm -hmm. So the CD57 had been seen for a long time as very specific um, at the beginning only for Lyme disease. That had changed a lot uh, within the past uh, two and a half years um, uh, based on new um, pr uh, new published data um, uh, from Dr. Shah. Uh, the CD57 is now seen as a, a general chronic parameter for tick-borne diseases. Uh, so um, uh, uh, new studies had uh, shown that uh, if there's any suppression of the CD57 cells, it is mostly linked to uh, Borrelia, or uh, Bartonella or Chlamydia, Mycoplasma. So, uh, what, uh, so the whole bunch of uh, what we call co-infection. Um, uh, based on the elder um, uh, studies, it was also quite clear that um, viral infection does not have any impact on the CD57 cells, and most of the normal or call it normal bacterial infection um, uh, uh, did the same. So there was only uh, some impact by uh, one of these um, tropical disease called chingunguya fever, um, uh, which could uh, uh, which also led uh, to some drop down of the CD57, but no other disease. So meanwhile, um, if there is any um, uh, any suppression of the CD57 cell count. And there's another point uh, I want to admit. So the CD57 will be not show up in acute stages. So within the first six months, uh, it would be unusual to see suppression of CD57. And that is the reason why we see that more as a, a chronic parameter. So uh, based on our experience now, long-term experience, um, uh, so it will take minimum nine to 12 months to see first suppression. Okay. If it's uh, present, then it's definitely a good indicator that this patient um, uh, uh, is dealing with Lyme disease for a longer time. So on average, minimum one year. And if you saw the CD57 extremely low, mm -hmm. 5, 10, 20, yeah. 30, would you expect to see that reflected in the, in the top part of the test? Would you expect to, for, that, for that person to... Um, find it very difficult to get a positive immune response test. You know, exactly. And uh, so, you know, um, uh, so the, the normal believing is um, if you have a very severe infection, you, uh, you should show up with very high titers in the ELISA test uh, with a huge um, uh, a bunch of uh, different bands in the Western blot. And uh, you should see, see the same uh, in the uh, cellular testing and um, in the uh, CD57 cell test. Um, but our um, experience is completely different. So if someone uh, is um, having this uh, health issue for a long time, um, with a very depressed CD57, this is more um, seen as a, a more severe a depression of the immune function. Yeah, mm -hmm. and mostly these patients with very very low um, uh, values of CD57, they will also present um, at the beginning 
low um, activity in the ALE spot and very often seronegative activity in the ALE spot and um, uh, uh, no pathological finding in the western blood. And we have seen really a high number of patients who did exactly so and later on under successful treatment um, the picture changed completely. So uh, you know um, uh, this is um, also uh, um, a very obje objective sign of improvement. If uh, patients are responding well on the treatment on the antimicrobials later on, uh, they were um, a step by step um, in, uh, see increasing values of CD57, which is a good sign. And um, uh, um, and um, again, uh, so if they have started with higher values of the uh, 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 in the early spot, they will see um, uh, a scale down more and more. Um, but at the very beginning, with our treatment, uh, you can really see uh, only very depressed CD57 uh, with no response in the early spot, no response in serological testing. And how about CD3? It's not on this test, but it's do you... Not, uh, so, um, uh, so, you know, um, uh, uh, the, the correct uh, term of this test me, uh, is uh, CD3 negative, CD57 positive. It's just an abbreviation. It's okay. uh, pretty the same. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so then the, the final part of this panel, um, which is the Lyme bundle, the Regenerous Lyme bundle, for anybody that was actually wondering what this test is, um, is uh, part of a blood chemistry screen. Mm -hmm. So I don't need you to go through and explain all of the different analytes, but could no, you yeah, just quickly... Uh, of course. Blood count. Uh, but there's, uh, in this case, one mm -hmm. interesting finding, and um, this is, uh, uh, should be very interesting for all the colleagues listening today. Uh, you know, um, there are uh, many reasons to see um, a high elevated MCV. So the MCV is a description, uh, finally, of the volume of the red blood cells. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this could have also uh, a different meaning. Uh, if you're um, uh, well introduced here in the topic of Lyme disease and co-infection, mm -hmm. uh, you're aware that most of the uh, bacterial infection are so-called intracellular bugs. Mm -hmm. And um, um, uh, and uh, two of them have um, uh, a very important meaning, and that is one bacterial infection called Bartonella, mm -hmm. and uh, the other is a parasitic infection, Babesia. Mm -hmm. And um, both um, uh, um, uh, both germs um, will um, very often hide in the red blood cells, and that could also lead to higher values of the MCV. Yeah, um, okay. it means uh, if you have constantly uh, pathological findings, all the other serological or cellular testings, mm -hmm. and uh, if you if you are, um, if you have confirmed or highly suggested a problem with Bartonella or Babesia infection, mm -hmm. uh, you you will see in parallel very often at the beginning elevated MCV uh, values mm -hmm. and uh, also if you start treatment um, you will see more and more normalization. Uh, this is an indirect indicator. There mm -hmm. are for sure several other reasons for elevated MCVs um, uh, could be a sign for example of uh, lack of uh, specific vitamins, vitamin B12 for example or mm -hmm. folic acid as well. Uh, I'm pretty aware of that but mm -hmm. um, seeing that um, through a different angle as a specialist for tick-borne diseases, we should keep that in mind as well. So if you've controlled for B12, folate, B6, yes. um, and they're all within optimal range or within normal range, and you've got symptoms um, and it fits with the rest of that, you can be aware that this might be one of the jigsaw puzzle pieces. Exactly. Are there any other, just quickly, are there any other um, similar red flags that might pop up in the clinical yeah, case. Uh, uh, so, you know, uh, in the differential blood count, um, we always uh, have a look on the eosinophils, um, uh, eosinophil granulocytes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, you know, um, this could uh, uh, be the first information about onset of uh, allergic reaction or intolerances, or um, if patients uh, uh, don't show up uh, with, uh, with allergies, it could be a sign of uh, additional parasitic um, uh, burden as well. So then you have to go in more differential diagnostic as well. And um, uh, so a similar, um, uh, similar parameter, if, uh, if there's a chance to go back on the first um, uh, page of the results. Um, um, so 
no, a bit lower. Uh, I need the Ely spot uh, uh, again. So, you know, um, uh, going back on the uh, Borrelia burgdorferi Ely spot, mm -hmm. you in this case, uh, 15 spots for the fully antigen, which is a recombinant antigen, so uh, very reliable. Mm -hmm. um, the peptide mix is just for, uh, uh, it, it's just a, a, another control. This is a, a, a mix of uh, different um, uh, peptides, uh, even uh, to get uh, confirmation of the fully antigen testing. And you see um, a third one, LFA1. Mm -hmm. this had nothing to do with uh, all these infectious diseases. The LFE1 is a good uh, uh, parameter, uh, giving us first hints on possible problems uh, with, um, uh, with uh, autoimmune or allergy problems. So right. if we see elevated um, uh, values, um, uh, so due to my personal experience, the LFA1 um, uh, parameter uh, will be earlier uh, show up than the eosinophil fields or the total IgG, for example. Okay. Uh, it's also an important parameter, um, um, and if you're more experienced, it could be very beneficial and supportive uh, for, um, uh, for better diagnostic. Fantastic. That's very, very important and very interesting to know. Um, so I've just got three more questions about this test before we move on to talking about PCR. Yep. Um, number one is how often did you recommend that we retest? Sorry, could you repeat? Of course. How often? How, how often do you recommend that we rerun these tests if we're treating no, okay. somebody? Um, uh, no, uh, we have um, a, a clear standard um, here in our clinic. Mm -hmm. um, so um, uh, in the first uh, meetings or appointments with patients uh, to collect all the data. So again, important are all the information about the medical history mm -hmm. and also important are um, uh, to get uh, as best as possible information about the actual standing regarding all these uh, infectious diseases. So Lyme and um, his co-infections. Um, uh, uh, then the next uh, control is mostly after two months of treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, so after two months uh, being on antimicrobials in any type, um, uh, you will get a much clearer picture. And if you compare uh, the testings before starting treatment and now under treatment, um, you will get uh, more clearer information how big the burden is. Yeah, you know, um, uh, we have um, discussed about the different polymorphic forms. Mm -hmm. So one test uh, based on, um, on uh, several publications uh, that in late stage Lyme, we suggest that most of the uh, 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 are present as so-called round body forms, mm -hmm. uh, not in the original spiroketal form. And um, um, this is one of the problems, or many of them are hidden uh, in dormant forms in the intracellular space of any cell, uh, for example, uh, uh, just to, this is one of their survival um, strategies or mechanism. And um, uh, so if we start treatment, so, and after two months, we get a more realistic picture. So especially in those cases uh, who had uh, showed up at the beginning really with weak um, uh, activity in the ELI spot or very depressed CD57, uh, if we have then once started the treatment after two months, um, you see very often higher activity in the ELI spot, but a lot of clinical improvement and first um, uh, 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 increase CD57. Then you can be sure that you are really on a good track. Yeah, and um, so we have seen uh, these differences in around in two patients group. So 40% uh, of the patient uh, will get more activity uh, in the ELI spot um, under treatment, uh, but clinical improvement. And uh, some of, uh, uh, in this 40% group, you can sometimes see another drop down of the CD57 cells, but at the same time, clinical improvement. So at the beginning, so we had to, to uh, we had to learn or to understand this development. So meanwhile, it's clear. Um, uh, while uh, being treated, you're always pushing uh, all these inactive or dormant form out of their protected environment. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you will uh, temporarily show up with more activity. And that, uh, needs, uh, that means also some more burden for your immune response um, and could lead to lower CD57 cells. But if you see at the same time, um, best clinical improvement, you are um, uh, on the best way. 
Yeah, and um, the 60% group will start immediately uh, with um, a drop down of uh, of um, uh, of the daily spot um, uh, um, uh, values and uh, immediately increasing CD57. Great, thank you. Um, question number two: Where can we find more information about the bands? Uh, if we wanted to better understand, I don't. I don't need you to run through it. But. I can Yeah. So, um, um, so I have um, uh, uh, two pages uh, with some more information, which Perfect. we can provide via Regenerous Labs. Wonderful. And last, very quick question: Could you please repeat the name of the two people who published? Um, one was Shah. Uh, um, um, uh, was uh, the latest publication, uh, Dr. Jotsna Shah uh, mm -hmm. from um, uh, Palo Alto, California. Mm -hmm. And um, the first publication uh, was done by Stricker and Stinger. So if there's any need, I can also provide uh, these studies as well. That would be wonderful. Okay, so that, um, that is a, thank you very much because that was a very, very thorough, very interesting interpretation of the um, basic line panel. And um, now that brings me, I guess, to what I personally think is the most exciting part of our webinar, which we're going to talk about um, your new PCR panel, looking at Lyme. Um, so we don't have a copy of a sample report, but um, if you could just tell me um, something about the PCR uh, test that you used, why did you decide it was necessary um, and, you know, take it from there. Um, uh, it's also quite easy to, um, uh, to explain. Um, so around 2010, uh, um, uh, we had a lot of patients. Um, uh, uh, who had a suggested Bartonella and Babesia infection. Mm -hmm. So we went on the typical serological testing, but it was always seronegative. At this time, uh, the only available PCR was in the US. Mm -hmm. so, um, uh, so from one point on, we sent um, uh, blood to the US and um, we got exactly the confirmation we are looked for. So these um, uh, suggested patient, uh, so based only on clinical finding as being a Bartonella or Babesia patient, got the confirmation via PCR testing. Um, so unfortunately, um, uh, so um, uh, here in Germany or in other parts of Europe, uh, there was no chance to get similar testing. So the plan was um, uh, to do that as soon as is possible. Um, uh, and um, around five years ago, we started with first activities and um, over the past uh, two and a half or three years uh, with more uh, intensity, even to get uh, the best possible uh, PCR testing. So, um, uh, so actually we can uh, offer um, uh, a big panel uh, of, uh, uh, of testing. So, you know, um, uh, we can test the tick uh, on different um, uh, bacterial and viral infection. We can um, uh, detect body fluids, means blood, um, uh, spinal fluid, um, the joint fluid, um, if necessary. And we can uh, also test uh, human samples like biopsies, lymph nodes, whatever it is. And um, with this technique, um, uh, we are focused on the DNA of these uh, bacteria. So, uh, and, um, so uh, the PCR testing is uh, more seen as a direct proof um, of presence of these um, uh, 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 pathogens of DNA, like Borrelia, like Bartonella, like Babesia. And um, uh, regarding the sensitivity, um, uh, PCR can also show up with some, um, uh, some advantages. So um, again, uh, we, have, we have still problems in the serological testings for, um, for Bartonella and Babesia, for example. So the chance of getting them in the routine testing is up to 5%, nothing more. Um, uh, in body fluids, um, uh, using the PCR technique, um, it's definitely um, a minimum 30%. If we go on specific fluids like joint uh, fluid or um, on um, uh, human samples, so biopsies, the chance is uh, uh, up to more than 50%. And it, it's also uh, linked to the volume uh, you are um, going before starting the testing. So um, this is one of the secrets. Uh, you need a bigger volume of blood, um, the best would be the whole blood, not the serum, mm -hmm. uh, to test on that. 
Right, because you said that um, some of the microbes actually inhabit the red blood cell. So you would need for that to be present. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's the reason why we have seen better results in the whole blood. Uh, you know, finally, you will destroy um, the, uh, the, the blood cell, the white ones as well as the red ones, uh, mm -hmm. even to get the free set of uh, the DNA. And then it's much easier to target uh, this uh, into the um, uh, PCR testing. So do you think that this will replace the original testing? Uh, no, I don't think it's a replacement, uh, but it's an uh, it's another uh, good option uh, to get finally a diagnosis. You know, um, so uh, so we've discussed the problem of seronegativity um, uh, in uh, in a uh, in a. Uh, I would say higher number of patients. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, so with the PCR, we have another test a tool uh, to get finally a proper diagnosis, and that is exactly what patients want and what what the doctor uh, wants to get um, uh, to start on the safe basement uh, the treatment, and not only on the clinical sides. Do you think that PCR? I mean. The conventional system, there's a, a really um, still a very strong part of the conventional system that recognizes Lyme only as an acute issue. Uh, a patient presents, they've seen a tick bite, they've got the erythema migrans rash, um, and they will have antibodies and then they're given two weeks of antibiotics. And that people who are practicing in that way often are not very open to the discussion around uh, chronic Lyme being a problem in the first place or uh, the testing that we use for chronic Lyme, you know, the Ellie spot and, uh, or the old LTT testing. Do you think that PCR is going to be better accepted um, by yeah. the conventional system? No, uh, exactly, because, you know, this is 100% approval. Yeah? If, you're, uh, if you're once be uh, positive in the PCR, then it's pretty hard uh, even uh, for those ones who are not accepting um, uh, this chronic condition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and so then you have the needed evidence. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's much easier to convince them. And also it couldn't be anything else, you know, that it's not a chance that it's a cross reactivity or a, a problem No, no, with no uh, definitely. So uh, the PCR is very, very specific, uh, even more um, um, than, um, uh, than other testing. And again, it's a direct testing. Mm -hmm. That means uh, we are looking for the DNA of these um, different bacteria. And mm -hmm. if you get uh, a confirmation, uh, that means uh, if you see the DNA of these bacteria, um, then uh, you have the evidence of uh, still present of these uh, infectious diseases. So which are the, which are the um, microbes, which are the germs that you are looking for the most with PCR testing? So you said um, that Bartonella and Babesia, it's very difficult to find them with the conventional yeah, test. And, uh, especially for those both um, uh, germs, it's, uh, it's a really um, a good chance um, uh, in looking for. And uh, we are also offering uh, the, uh, the PCR testing for Borrelia, um, for chlamydia pneumoniae and uh, chlamydia trachomatis, uh, these are the most often seen co-infection. Mm -hmm. for, the, for, the, for the MDs who are watching this webinar, um, who have access uh, more than a nutritional therapist would to a biopsy, what are the tissues that you're looking for or looking, I know that that's germ specific, so could you explain that a little bit? Yeah, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, many of our patients uh, uh, will get a surgery uh, while having the problem, so the orthopedic specialist or the surgeon will decide uh, to go for surgery for, uh, uh, for example, carpal tunnel syndrome. Yeah, and um, so um, then it's quite easy to get a biopsy or from a knee inspection uh, to get a tiny um, a piece of, um, of the ligaments or whatever it is. And uh, then you have really great chance of, um, uh, of detection of these uh, uh, the, uh, of the DNA of these bacteria, um, and um, so uh, yesterday I had a patient here in my consultation, um, uh, a young guy uh, having uh, first issues since March this year um, with a very uh, a severe swollen knee with knee pain, and he got uh, within one week three uh, knee surgeries, um, and uh, the surgeon was wondering what's going on, so because he couldn't find any pathological findings uh, while the surgery and. Uh, but he uh, did some biopsies and um, he looked, uh, he 
took some uh, joint fluid mm -hmm. and surprise, surprise, um, uh, Borrelia was found. And then it was quite easy, uh, you know. Um, so there was immediately start with antibiotics. And now uh, uh, a couple of weeks later, um, the, uh, uh, the guy is uh, getting more and more improvement. Um, I guess if they have looked before, um, uh, um, uh, maybe on the typical uh, germs causing um, uh, these monoarthritis, Borrelia, Chlamydia, Yersinia, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, might be that uh, there haven't been any need for any surgery, uh, surgery, uh, surgery uh, uh, intervention. So surgery, I mean, medic, that kind of um, invasive medical intervention will tend to happen because there is symptoms in a, in a specific yeah. tissue. It's not, yeah. it's not being done in order to look for Lyme. It's being done because there's a problem and we can look for Lyme at the same time. Uh, so a normal gym, uh, a GP uh, could take also um, uh, a little skin biopsy. This is easy to take. Um, and you know we need a tiny um, uh, little piece uh, to go on PCR. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, if you would go um, into an erythema uh, migrans, uh, that, uh, Unfortunately, you have the diagnosis, but if you go on a biopsy, uh, you have a, a very high chance uh, to see uh, the uh, DNA in the PCR. Mm -hmm. Or, um, you know, uh, for Bartonella, we have also a lot of um, typical um, uh, skin findings. If you go um, uh, to, uh, on a biopsy uh, from these specific parts of the Bartonella rashes, you have really good chances also to de detect on, Bart uh, on Bartonella. And this is not very invasive and could be done by uh, any physician and there's not really a time as long as the as long as the patient has sim is symptomatic it the time between original infection and 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 the testing done with PCR is irrelevant is that correct uh, you know, uh, this is what I have learned. Um, there's mostly a long distance uh, in getting the infection and outbreak of the illness. So um, I would say most of the patients I have seen, and uh, there have been quite a lot, um, uh, uh, are suggested um, uh, of getting the infection very, very early in life. And uh, mostly being a child or a young uh, uh, adolescent, um, uh, your immune system is relatively proper working. So that means uh, there's a good chance after getting getting a tick bite and transmission of Borrelia um, uh, um, uh, uh, to get um, um, uh, a full um, uh, uh, solution of the problem by your own immune system. Mm -hmm. But if there, uh, some of the bacteria will survive, uh, you can get uh, uh, at a much, much later point the outbreak of the illness. And what we have seen, this is mostly connected um, uh, to massive forms of uh, stress, could be emotional stress for a longer time, physical stress mental stress and um, uh, so uh, and uh, therefore it's so important uh, to listen carefully to your patient and uh, their stories um, so you will get a lot of information so uh, because they will mostly report that the outbreak of the illness um, was um, uh, was very close connected to these uh, massive forms of stress and <clears throat> um... Could you talk about any of the confounding variables for the tests, medications, steroids, what are the um, what are the things that might? This is also a good question. So, if even possible, we would prefer uh, to run the testing uh, without any pre-medication. Um, so, a spe specifically, um, uh, immunosuppressive agent like steroids uh, could have definitely impact on the CD fifty seven immune status as well as on the ALE spot. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's not uh, possible, you know. Um, so, there are um, sometimes health condition that you have to go um, uh, on both on antimicrobials as well as on uh, immunosuppressants, so especially if, if you have at the same time uh, autoimmune diseases and very severe uh, infection. Uh, but even in those cases, we would go on these um, uh, testings, but under um, uh, different um, uh, conditions of interpretation. So the best would be uh, to have no influence by antibiotics before starting the treatment and uh, immunosuppressive agents. Fantastic. So that's best practice. So I'm just going to uh, do a little kind of summary. If I, and you can tell me if I've got this right or not. So um, first, we're going to sit down and really listen to our patient. We're going to take a comprehensive history. We are going to listen to the patient's story. Um, 
and then we are going to evaluate their symptom collection and their symptom pattern uh, and compare that to the, um, the lists of different symptoms for each microbe. Um, that once we've, and that's probably the, the most information, right? That's probably where we're going to get a really good understanding of which are the likely infections and co-infections and viral infections that, um, that this person has. And then we're going to layer on top of that the testing to try to confirm our, our suspicion. So we have available to us the, um, the Lyme panel with first the two-tier testing, then the LE spot and the immune system testing looking at um, CD57 and um, looking for patterns also in, the, in blood chemistry. And if we continue to, um, if that is inconclusive or, uh, but we really have a strong intuition that this is actually Lyme, then we can add PCR testing into that to confirm the presence of um, the actual microbe in the body. Is that right? No, that's uh, absolutely correct. So with Lyme and with, uh, with patients who have chronic Lyme, one of the things that you've said to me is that um, everybody is going to have three major problems. They're going to have the infection themselves and, and the, uh, the problems that arise as a result of that direct infection. Then they're going to have inflammation and they're going to have immune suppression. Yeah. Um, and one of the things, again, that you do in your clinical practice um, or in your clinic in Germany is that you are not just focusing on okay, we've identified the germ, we're going to give these antibiotics, but you're actually looking at cellular support, you're looking at immune system support, you're looking at vitamin and mineral deficiencies and food intolerances. And um, do you want to elaborate a little bit on that as well? Not, not for sure. And this is very important. You know, um, in the 90s, we have been focused only on, uh, on Lyme or on the infection. Uh, with um, compare uh, to, uh, uh, to today um, uh, with really uh, uh, bad outcoming results. Not even 50% of the chronic uh, stages had improved. Later on, uh, we have learned that there was something else. So the complexity uh, was much bigger. So including the co-infection. Uh, and a bit later, um, uh, uh, we have learned uh, that um, uh, having uh, issues with chronic infection, automatically you have uh, at the same time a problem with local or general inflammation. And uh, so in the new generation of the uh, ALI spots, uh, we include this problem uh, while introducing another uh, cytokine, interleukin-2, to mm -hmm. get additional information about um, uh, the problem of inflammatory processes, uh, local ones as well as general ones because this is um, a lot of influence uh, in our treatment decision so you know uh, you can uh, have treated um, a very successfully um, a bacterial infection but um, uh, uh, with a patient could still remain um, uh, some of the symptoms joint pain muscle pain and um, uh, so mostly then it's more um, uh, based on local inflammation. So the approach would not uh, anymore be uh, to intensify or to restart antibiotics. And then um, the best approach would be uh, with some anti-inflammatory support, for example. And again, um, uh, I would see 100% of the patient presenting chronic infection, they have automatically chronic inflammation. And that should be always included. So uh, as an integrative or holistic approach. And it's the same uh, with the immunosuppression. Most of the patient will be very suppressed at the beginning. That means um, they need uh, support for your, uh, their immune function. And if you add um, the, uh, the, the needed immunosupport, you will get faster and better outcoming results. So, uh, and that is what I have learned um, uh, uh, now for more than 28 years. And, um, so I've uh, uh, taken care for myself for nearly 18,000 patients now. Uh, so there's a lot of expertise in that field. It certainly is. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, an, another side of Lyme. So Lyme, once you have um, an infectious agent on board, of course we are, human beings are not... 100% human. In fact, we're actually barely human if you look at it from a, from a sort of global perspective. Um, we are, a human being is a, um, a microcosm, you know, we're a sort of um, human microbe uh, 
what would you call that? Kibbutz is the word I usually use, but um, uh, combination. So do you think it's possible to have Lyme as part of your total, or even one of the co-infections, as part of your total microbial community and be healthy? Do you think that you can live with Lyme in a symbiotic yeah, way? I'm, uh, uh, I'm totally convinced that that could happen, you know. Um, if you go, um, uh, if you look in some epidemiological sta uh, uh, studies, you will find a high incidence of uh, Lyme or other co-infection in a certain group of the patient, for example, hunters, yeah, or uh, f um, f um, uh, if you go fishing, um, uh, you will be also exposed, or if you're a hiker or a mountain biker, whatever you are, um, if, there, uh, if you're living in a high endemic area, you can uh, get in contact with uh, one of these germs. And if you have really a good immune function, um, your immune system is definitely able in many or in most of the cases to handle the problem as best. So that means you can show up later on uh, with uh, a certain amount of titers. Um, that means you can have IgG antibodies in your uh, serum uh, um, uh, without presenting any symptoms and complaints. Yeah, that means somewhere in the past there have been a contact via tick bite or insect bite. So, you know, there are uh, many ways now, uh, uh, now known uh, for transmission. And uh, it, uh, it hasn't to be only the tick. So we are aware of that horse flies or even uh, the normal mosquitoes can transmit the infection uh, based on studies from Finland and from Germany some time ago. Uh, that means um, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the function of your immune system or the body function is very important. Yeah. Uh, again, it's not an automatically um, uh, 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 proceed uh, that you will get um, uh, uh, ill. Um, so um, this will show up only um, getting contact with these uh, germs, um, bacteria, viruses, whatever it is. Um, but um, uh, most of the patient finally um, uh, have best chances uh, uh, to heal themselves uh, by a good uh, immune function. So if somebody comes positive in a Lyme panel and they're not symptomatic, do you treat or no? No, never. Um, so the only recommendation I'm giving my patient is wait and watch. Keep that in mind. Um, so um, there, there are signs that you have had contact and nobody could uh, tell you exactly at this point uh, if there's any hidden bacteria uh, in the intracellular layer space or if there are uh, um, some round body uh, uh, in your uh, organism. So if you would notice um, uh, at a later point um, any onset of specific or unspecific um, a symptom, then go again on testing, um, compare the results and then if needed, Needed uh, start treatment, but without having any symptoms uh, complaints, I wouldn't uh, uh, go in any treatment. And then a similar question to that is going to be: if somebody is, um, or somebody, the child comes home and has a tick, or they themselves are bitten by a tick, would you treat prophylactically, or would you just run early spot? Um, um, uh, so this is a very uh, good question, not so easy to answer, um, but I try my very best. Um, so, um, if you're living in a high endemic area, um, presenting a tick bite without an erythema migrant, mm -hmm. um, um, I would go in, uh, in children on treatment, uh, at least for, uh, um, so our suggestion is uh, 20 days uh, minimum, um, then you are definitely on the safe side uh, regarding uh, um, uh, 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 best treatment of this uh, acute infection. Mm -hmm. um, if uh, you're living in an uh, area which is not very uh, well known as an high endemic area, uh, then I would uh, also wait and watch. That means to go uh, immediately on an early spot, um, mm -hmm. even to figure out if there's any risk or later on on a serological testing. Um, um, uh, but again, in a very high endemic area with a high chance of transmission, sometimes it's better to start immediately uh, than to wait and watch. And can you, in that scenario, would you consider um, 
herbal antimicrobials or only only prescription? Um, uh, so, you know, um, I'm a big fan of uh, naturopathic remedies, so the herbal um, antimicrobial. So we have, uh, meanwhile, long experience uh, and really good experience with that. Mm -hmm. um, but um, uh, only for the chronic stages. I wouldn't go on herbals um, um, in acute stages uh, because um, um, there is um, a too high risk of um, later on getting persistent form. Mm -hmm. So uh, in stage one and stage two, I guess there's a very clear indication uh, to start um, um, the conventional antimicrobials meet the antibiotics. You know, this is only a short-term treatment and most of the patient could stand that. Only uh, maybe uh, if someone um, uh, has um, a big problem with allergies or if, if it wouldn't be possible to put them on the conventional treatment, then uh, it would be the only alternate solution. But in general, I would prefer always the conventional approaches in stage one and stage two. But in chronic um, stages, I'm very open-minded. And I can tell you at this uh, time, uh, so um, in the past, looking back, so 10 years uh, before, uh, we have started only with the uh, uh, conventional treatment. So I would say 95%. And uh, the herbal uh, compounds had been always uh, the alternative solution for someone who didn't want to take any chemistry you know um, that was the normal case but meanwhile um, we see a constantly shift um, we have around 15% um, uh, 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 of the patient in treatment for uh, chronic health condition being only on herbals with really good outcoming results so um, uh, comparing the uh, conventional approaches and the herbal approaches um, um, uh, showing um, nearly a similar outcoming results, but with some delay. Uh, so comparable is around um, a six uh, months trial with 12 to 18 months trial uh, on um, these uh, herbal uh, compounds or herbal protocols. Um, so again, 15% are going only for on herbal protocols. We have meanwhile a um, uh, percentage around 20 to 25% where we mix the herbals with the conventional treatment, and that was based on um, uh, uh, on, uh, on a study done by Professor Gilbert at the University of Jyväskylä in Finland. Mm -hmm. um, she is very focused um, uh, in his uh, in her research center uh, on uh, better treatment options. And uh, so, in uh, uh, one of the studies published in 2016, it came up: if you go on both, you can go on lower dosages of the conventional antibiotics um, um, uh, because of very good synergistic effects and um, this is uh, definitely a more and more common approach even in our clinic so uh, we use the advantages of both and we minimize the disadvantages and uh, so meanwhile I guess uh, 60 to 65 of the patient um, uh, going on the conventional protocols. Who do you think is doing the best research at the moment? Who, who are you watching with interest? Uh, um, uh, so I can tell you, so um, there's a lot going on. Uh, unfortunately, less here in Europe. Um, I'm, uh, I'm a bit um, uh, frustrated or uh, disappointed uh, about ongoing research here in Germany or in other uh, European countries, I guess. Um, uh, um, so it's uh, still uh, an underestimated problem, but I'm very happy about um, a lot of progress um, uh, in the US. Uh, there are several um, uh, research centers, so actually uh, Columbia is still doing a very good job um, uh, regarding uh, diagnostic and um, uh, treatment and uh, new treatment approaches and uh, so over the past two years um, I guess um, uh, uh, Professor Sung and his team at uh, Johns Hopkins is doing a um, uh, really exciting job uh, supporting us with a lot of new information and uh, based on uh, so in the past I guess uh, now he has published uh, his uh, uh, eighth uh, publication about uh, new approaches and this is very supportive. I have the opportunity uh, uh, to meet him uh, several times um, uh, la uh, at least uh, three weeks ago in Baltimore and uh, he's really a fascinating guy because he's not part of any of the groups. Yeah, He's, uh, he's in between. Uh, mm -hmm. He's not an IDSA member or he's not an ILATS member. Uh, he does not have any conflicts. He's mm -hmm. only focused on solutions and mm -hmm. That is exactly what he and his uh, team uh, is doing. And I guess um, he, he's actually one of the uh, really um, uh, best um, uh, res uh, research centers uh, and uh, bring us much, much forward. Um, and 
then my last question is, what do you personally, do you, you live and work, I believe, still in a high endemic area? So what are the strategies that you employ to uh, not... You know, I'm, I'm definitely, since a couple of years, uh, much more uh, cautious going outside, but I'm, uh, I'm still doing so, you know. Um, so um, uh, we had always uh, a dog in our family. We have to walk the dog. Um, um, I'm an active golfer, so I'm always exposed, and I'm golfing here in a high endemic area. So, but I'm uh, going more and more uh, being careful. Um, so um, after being outside uh, with any outdoor activities, um, I'm going for a tick check, yeah, um, uh, and um, uh, to look at the clothes, to look on, uh, on my skin, and um, uh, uh, I'm happy so far. Uh, I can't remember any tick bite, and I'm using some repellents, for example, on my clothes, and I try everything to protect myself uh, in getting a tick bite. And um, if you if you're doing so, I wouldn't go any more with short trousers outside here in our woodland areas. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, definitely not, or, or only on the normal uh, ways, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, without any risk um, of uh, getting in contact with the grass or the bushes. Uh, mm -hmm. um, um, and uh, this is the uh, uh, most uh, dangerous area so far. You know, I, I told you this story already, but one of my husband's best friends has a, um, a property in Lyme. Connecticut and he's been bugging me to go and visit for a long time he wanted to you know they've done this beautiful renovation he wanted to show me so we did eventually go and then he wanted to show me also they bought the property next door so he wanted to show me that he wanted to walk through the um like along the lake with all the long grasses and I didn't I refused to do it I walked up in the middle of the driveway up to the road walked around walked down the other driveway I was terribly uncomfortable because <laughs> once you once you know um you know, I think the idea of walking in long grass in Lyme or walking in long yeah. grass in prepared so, areas. I wouldn't be really careful uh, in doing so. And I'm uh, in totally agreement. And, you know, there's definitely um, a higher and higher risk. Uh, you know, uh, one of my employees, by the way, um, uh, had a short walk out over the weekend. And on Saturday, um, she walked uh, across a grassland uh, mm -hmm. when she later on noticed having eight tick bites. Eight. Yeah. Eight, yeah, uh, <laughs> six limbs and two adult ticks uh, on uh, uh, both of her legs. And uh, so, uh, again, so the announcement here for Germany, for Europe. Um, so, for Europe, we expect this year 1.8 million new infections with Lyme. And in the US, it's around 1 million. Okay. This is an officially forecast uh, done beginning of April, which is a very high number. And um, uh, so you can read in many articles that will be, uh, I guess, the worst is um, uh, uh, tickier than ever. Uh, 2018 and let's talk again at the end of the year and um, um, I can tell you um, so within the last six weeks we never had so many acute um, stages of Lyme disease as um, as this oh, year. Sorry. So nearly every day new patients will step in to remove ticks or to take care for the erythema migrant or just um, uh, to get for uh, blood drawn uh, to exclude a potential risk of Lyme disease and that never happened before even living in a high endemic area. And that's very scary. Yeah it's um, scary. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Okay, so we are, look, we're at 90 minutes. I, I, I mean, I could talk to you for another six hours. We could just keep on going. <laughs> but, no problem, I guess, yeah. <laughs> but for the sake of the recording, and people do have to get back to work, you and I included. No, so sure. I am going to wrap it up. Thank you so much for your time today. It's been well, really fascinating. Pleasure, talking, with uh, talking with you and hopefully all the listeners, the colleagues um, uh, have um, learned a bit um, uh, in dealing with Lyme patient and um, uh, my offer is if there's any specific problem or any question so keep in contact with me uh, via Regenerous or directly to our clinic uh, it would be a pleasure to support you in specific questions. Listen it's really it's fantastic to have that support from somebody who is in clinical practice themselves yeah, you know yeah, who is yeah, learning yeah, from their patients. Uh, so my last comment uh, we are the, off, uh, the only officially training center of islets outside of the US uh, since uh, eight years and we are very proud of this. So uh, since 2006, we have trained uh, 1,200 doctors in trainee programs here in the clinic. And uh, every week uh, we have another uh, trainee. And um, uh, so our aim is to spread knowledge and expertise. Um, uh, so if someone is interested, uh, again, keep in contact with us.
Thank you very much for sharing your time and your expertise today. And I would like to really acknowledge you for the work that you're doing in um, helping the patients on the ground, but also in getting the information out there, not just with us and our patient base, but around the world. Thank you very much for the work that you do. It was a pleasure and uh, all the best for you all. And you. Thank you, Dr. Nicholas. Bye. Bye-bye.